Hello and welcome to Philosophy Live. Mr Lambie, the head of the School of Philosophy and Economic Science, encouraged me to investigate the life of St Hilda and I was very glad to do so because I've been holidaying in Whitby all my life and our cottage is overlooked by the site of the abbey that she founded. Hilda lived between 614 and 680 AD, so it is unsurprising that there are not many records of her life. Most of what we know comes from the 8th century historian Bede in his Ecclesiastical History. She's remembered for three main things, the founding and governing of Whitby Abbey, the discovery of the poet Cadman, and for presiding over the Synod of Whitby. Perhaps more important than all these three, though, is the fact that she was so admired for her wisdom and humble nature. She shone such a bright light in the world that here we are still talking about her today. Her figure is surrounded by folklore and there are many interesting tales told about her. The most famous of these is that the local Ammonite fossils were actually snakes which were turned to stone by St Hilda, symbolising her power of goodness over evil. I'll just share a picture of Cadman's cross with you now, which shows her, as she's often depicted, with Ammonites at her feet and carrying a pastoral staff. So what events led this lady to become such a revered abbess and later saint? The name Hilda, or Hild as she is sometimes called, means battle, and she did have a challenging life in many ways. England was at a time of great political and religious upheaval. The Romans had left a century earlier, and the country now comprised of small warring kingdoms. Hilda was a noblewoman born into one of the most powerful of these kingdoms, Northumbria, and she was the great niece of the Northumbrian king Edwin. But power attracts enemies, and Hilda's father, Hereric, had to go into exile and was later poisoned. Hilda's mother, Briguswith, then raised Hilda and her sister, Hereswith, alone as part of Edwin's court. Even before she was born, Hilda was a rousing interest. Bede recounts a dream that Hilda's mother had whilst her husband was in exile and she was in the dream whilst Briguswith is searching for her husband to no avail. She instead finds a most precious necklace under her garment. Bede goes on to say that it seemed to spread such a blaze of light that it filled all Britain with its gracious splendour. Bede was certain that the necklace represented Hilda because her life was, as he puts it, an example of the works of light. As she was growing up, most of the country, including the nobility of Northumbria, was mainly pagan, including Hilda and her family. But Edwin and his entire court converted to Christianity in 627 and were baptised by Paulinus, the first bishop of Northumbria, on Easter Day, on the site where York Minster stands today. Hilda was 13 at the time, and it must have been quite something to have been born at the beginning of this new era. Christianity was spreading across the country from two different centres, the Roman mission led by St Augustine, and the Celtic Christians led by such as Aidan, the Bishop of Lindisfarne, who greatly influenced Hilda and became her mentor and teacher. Bede reports that her career falls into two equal parts. The first 33 as a noble woman at court and the latter half dedicated to God. She left Northumbria when Edwin died in battle in 633 and went to live with her sister in the East Anglian court but after receiving a message from Aidan, was persuaded to live as a nun in the Iona tradition in a small monastic community by the Weir. After a year, she became the abbess <coughs> of the monastery in Hartlepool. And from there, she moved on to her life's great work in 657, 
when she established the monastery in Whitby, North Yorkshire, on land given to her by King Oswy of Northumbria. Whitby was a double abbey which housed men and women, and it was quite usual at the time for women to lead religious houses. Hilda was now in charge of one of the most important religious centres in the Anglo-Saxon world, and this placed her in a powerful political and cultural position. The Abbey became well known as a centre of great learning for the arts, sciences and, of course, scriptural study. Bede states that she carried out her task with great industry and at Whitby, her regime observed the virtues of justice, devotion and chastity, but above all things to continue in peace and charity. No one was rich, no one was in need for they all had things in common, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> for they had all things in common and none had any private property. So great was her prudence that not only ordinary people, but also kings and princes sometimes sought and received her counsel when in difficulties. The fact that five of the men trained by Hilda went on to become bishops highlights her skill as a mentor and scholar in her own right. She was clearly a woman of strong character, but not in a hard way. As Bede tells us, all that knew her called her mother because of her outstanding devotion and grace. She is sometimes called the first patron of English Christian poetry, and this is due to her discovery of the poet Cadman. At this time, monasteries were more like villages, with everything needed to support a community housed nearby. Cadman was one of the cowherds who worked at the abbey. He was illiterate and with no apparent talent for singing. Bede relates that a man appeared to Cadman in a dream and asked him to sing a song about the creation of things. After stating that he could not, Cadman then suddenly began to sing verses that he had never heard before, and he had composed what is now known as the Creation Hymn, which is the first recorded Old English poem. When he was taken to Hilda, she saw that he had been inspired and had a great gift, and she encouraged him to nurture it. He did, and was subsequently able to turn any piece of scripture that was read to him into song. This led to him becoming the first Anglo-Saxon poet of renown. Despite the fact that only a fragment has survived, his songs helped Christianity take root in England and he started a new tradition of songs of praise. Although Cadman's is the story that has survived, it is reasonable to think that Hilda had the quality of spotting and encouraging the innate gifts <coughs> of all those in her community from the learned Latin, Latin scholars to the labourers. Let's look now at the Synod of Whitby in 664, a major event in the life of the Christian church, with delegates coming from all over the country to attend. The fact that Whitby Abbey was chosen as the venue for this momentous occasion shows what a respected spiritual centre it was and what high esteem the Abbess Hilda was held in. As there had been orders of missionaries converting people to Christianity in England from both Iona and Rome, that meant that there was disparity in the way that it was being practised. The Synod was held <coughs> to decide whether the Celtic or the Roman practices should be followed, particularly concerning the date on which Easter should be celebrated. As the death and resurrection of Christ is the most important event in the Christian calendar, this was a matter that had to be decided. After much discussion, it was agreed that the Roman practice would be favoured, as it was argued that theirs was the teaching of St Peter, who holds the keys of heaven. This is a turning point for England, as it aligns the church with the continental practice, strengthening the country's connection with Europe. Although Hilda supported the Celtic tradition, she graciously accepted the decision to go with Rome for the sake of the unity of the church. According to Bede, despite being troubled with a feverish sickness for the last six years of her life, 
Hilda never complained and never ceased to give thanks to her maker and to instruct the flock committed to her charge. Just before her death, she apparently gathered the nuns and urged them to preserve the gospel peace among themselves and towards all others. Although nothing remains above the ground of the monastery that Hilda built, her legacy continues. She is the patron saint of many churches and there are roads, schools and universities named after her, including St Hilda's College in Oxford. <clears throat> and perhaps we can also continue her spiritual legacy by letting our own light shine, as she did, and by upholding some of her qualities of humility, acceptance, seeing the good in others, and as she said, above all things, to continue in peace and charity. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed the talk, please do like it and share it, and I hope you have a peaceful day.